Let's take a little time to reveal The prehistoric stories that the earth once concealed Mix them all together on this ancient land It's time to spread some paleo jam It's time for another episode of Paleo Jam Thanks to National Science Week We're at Flinders University Just south of Adelaide on Ghana Country South Australia And there is an audience of humans looking on Listening and making some noise In this episode, we're talking about access to academic collections and research. Specifically, we're going to be exploring the origin and utility of VAMP, the Virtual Australian Museum of Paleontology. To do this, my guests are three of, or the three original Vampers. Is that what we call you? Sure. Vampers, are all from Flinders University. That was Dr. Alice Clement. Hi, Alice. Hello, everyone. Dr. Aaron Caymans. And uh, PhD candidate Jacob Van Zolen. Good day. And um, okay, so where did the idea come from for this to begin with? Because it's a it's a pretty massive undertaking for those who haven't experienced Vamp yet. Um, Go find it online, the Virtual Australian Museum of Paleontology. And even if you listen back to this podcast a second time, have it in front of you, because I think some of the stuff we'll talk about will help you as you're, you're navigating and exploring and eventually... But what, what was the idea? What, why, why, why did it become a thing? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'd say paleontology has been undergoing something of a transformation in the last... It would be 10 to 20 years with the use of digital scanning technologies really increasing and it's becoming more and more accessible and it's becoming more widely used and adopted. And it's not just one technique, but there's a whole suite of techniques and we might cover some of that a little bit later on. But it's, um, it's just becoming more and more commonplace and more and more paleontologists are generating all of this digital data. And... It's, a, it's an amazing resource, and I think we'll also talk about this down the track, as there's so many different ways that this data can be used. Um, so really there was a... We felt like there was a need to collate the data that we were collecting just within our own research projects into one place where we could share and celebrate that data more readily, um, but also to bring together the scans and the work of other people as well and one of the main things is about making this stuff available not just to the one researcher who you know manages to get one specimen scanned but that that data should be available for everyone so we're really trying to make it more accessible and and because accessibility is really important when we because often on this podcast we talk about the importance of fossil heritage as being part of our in effect our, our cultural heritage and the best way is, is for people to have access to that information in all of its forms, including the, the effectively the, the raw data that they're looking at. And anyone can go onto VAMP, can't they? Absolutely. So if you haven't checked it out yet, I really encourage you to get online and check it out. It's a virtual museum that's free for anyone to visit. So there's a website um, where you can go on and explore... Uh, hundreds of scans of digital fossils that are on there already and they're spanning the full gamut of uh, multicellular life. So we've got the earliest multicellular life um, all the way through to recently extinct megafauna and everything in between. So it's it's a really cool resource. So, Aaron. And that can be found at sites.flinders.edu.au slash vamp. Thank you. Um, so you're old, Jacob. Yeah, ancient. Ancient. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, because often, like when I've visited Flinders, you're you're sitting in front of a computer, constantly, constantly doing stuff. What's been your role in this project? Um, so my primary role um, was uh, digitizing a lot of the specimens. So um, I've travelled to um, Vamp is a you know partnership with three main museums, uh, so the Western Australian Museum, the Museum and Art Galleries Northern Territory, and the South Australian Museum. And 
my role primarily was traveling to these museums and digitizing these specimens using um, a, uh, a mixed uh, method of uh, structured light scanning as well as uh, CT scanning to capture um, a lot of the specimens. So yeah, that, that, that process of digitizing, what, what, is it, what does it actually look like? If I was to, to, to be in the room watching you, do, 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 is, is it, do, do you have a machine that you carry with you or do you take the specimens to somewhere? What, what does that actually look like? Well, it depends on the methods. So structured light scanning, um, mostly with the methods that we used in the in the past with um, with with the two scans that we've had, um, you can. It has a lot of advantages of you can take the scanner to the museum with the specimens. So the the specimens don't have to move from the collection most of the time, and you essentially just need to find a nice little dark spot somewhere in the corner. It can be. Um, uh, quite intense um, because you're in the darkness for like eight hours a day um, and you're digitizing um, these these specimens by um, essentially projecting a pattern onto the object and then there's a couple of cameras on the device which depending on how this pattern changes on the object it can use that to reconstruct it in 3D space. So by doing this, you can you can capture a lot of the surface of the of the specimen uh, relatively quickly and and cheaply without uh, damaging the specimen. But if you want to capture like internals, um, and Alice would be able to talk about this a lot uh, better than I can, uh, you uh, basically take it to a um, you you, see, you CT scan it um, to essentially capture a series of, of uh, x-rays and slices. So you can see what it looks like on the inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. essentially. You, yeah. Want, you want to see what's, what's on the inside yeah. instead of just uh, yep. the surface of what you can see. So, Aaron, your role in the project? Good question. I'm basically just chasing along on the coattails tales of these two amazing people. So one of the things that Jake was underselling himself on was the amount of legwork he did talking to people at conferences and things before any of this initially started. In terms of establishing whether there was a national desire to have this framework developed and also to um, look at what form that might take. And we've also had a panel of mentors that have helped us through this project as well. So um, I guess my contribution to what's actually gone onto the website is the trace fossil side of things in the um, form of mainly fossil footprints, but also things like bite marks and what we've got there. So. Um, Digital data in that sense can be quite important because, in fact, many of these trace fossils are in areas where we can't collect the original specimen. And so the only record we have of them sometimes is a cast where we can make it or some kind of scan. And we use a method called photogrammetry for that, which basically is computer software that takes a bunch of photos and turns that into a three-dimensional image. So it's a it's kind of along the same general pathway as the structured light scanning, but different to our X-ray methods like um, the CT scanning or synchrotron or neutron beam uh, at, or even sort of laser scanning. So this, this whole access thing, we, we, we touched on it at the, at the beginning um, and the importance of it, because we, I, I spoke to some students at University of Adelaide a few weeks ago and, and, and the, the talk was about science communication but I talked a little bit about communication between sciences, scientists and the, the, the problem with the model that exists in terms of publishing. Um, so as a, as a songwriter, if I put my music on Spotify or Apple Music you know, I'm the one that's, that's created the music. I have the intellectual property in the music. I put it up onto Spotify. Spotify take a share. But the business model is that because I'm the creator of the thing, I actually get paid for it. Part of the problem with, with the academic model over years has been that you folk create this stuff, that you create the research, then you pay or your institution <laughs> pays to have the work published in a journal and then the journal keeps all the money which I just find completely and utterly bizarre and bonkers and the sooner it breaks the better and if you can't comment that's okay <laughs> um, but something like this I think is so important because it gives access to people 
everyone the, the raw information. And one of the things we talked about at this, this, this talk that I gave is that people worry about, oh, well, if people don't know exactly the thing, then, you know, that maybe don't let them have the information. Well, people have access to misinformation. People readily have access to misinformation, so maybe give them access to actual information. Aaron? Yeah, so this kind of uh, ties into a fundamental point of what museums are supposed to be achieving, and that is providing a safe space for the storing of specimens, but also making them available to study. And uh, one of the things that in the past people have been very protective of is their scans because it feeds into that intellectual property side of things. And in our partnering with Morphosource on this project, we actually have a framework in, pay, in place where people who are producing these scans can actually be acknowledged in terms of being cited in papers, those kinds of things, for the work they are producing. So you don't lose that link to it, but at the same time, you are making things accessible, which is one of the core values of what we do in terms of making collections available. Yeah, Alice. And yeah, I was just gonna say, for those of us in Australia, a lot of us are funded by Australian Research Council. It's actually our responsibility to make our research available. Like we, that's the absolute responsibility we have. And um, yeah, you alluded to the academic publishing model and that's bananas for um, a number of reasons, but we won't go into that. But what we've seen with the scanning um, world over the last few years is that often it's been the really wealthy labs in the wealthiest countries that are able to sort of gatekeep this digital paleontology and that's just not fair and that's not equitable and that's not how science should be done. Um, and so we felt very strongly about making these specimens available. And it's, you know, anyone in the globe can now get online and access a specimen. They don't have to apply for a grant and travel to Australia and manage to get into the museum, which is sometimes harder than it should be, um, to access a certain specimen to do the research that they, you know, that they're trying to do. So we're, we're really just, you know, making things so much more readily available for people all over the world, and that's how it should be. Did, did, did you get any resistance from, like, big paleo? <laughs> 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 uh, no. Feel free to not answer. Well, um, um, I Jack guess, I think was gonna... well, well, but, but on that front, certainly museums are worried about what can potentially be done in terms of losing ownership of those specimens and, and how that gets recognised. So there has been a negotiation process and a series of um, practices or rules in place in order to be able to make sure that we can access those and to make them available. And is that, and I guess that's part of the process of working out how this thing works, isn't it? Because because it took the music industry, and even now, you know, you, when, when, when streaming services came on board, you, you constantly had to adapt. I mean, years ago, there was this thing called Napster, and people weren't getting paid, and their music was getting stolen, and then it's like, well, you had to find a model in the work, because otherwise the creative people stop creating the creative work, or they don't. So, so how has it been? Jacob, you look like, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, so um, with uh, scientists particularly, um, so the, the one of the reasons why scientists are hesitant of sharing their data is because they just simply want to be like accredited for their work. So if, you know, the worry is if you put your specimens up online, then you spent all this money, all this energy traveling to these places, collecting this data what's in it, you know, for you, because it's science is competitive and there's, you know, limited number of grants. And if you're essentially giving your competition, um, you know, all this, this, these, these resources that you spend all this time collecting, then I can understand the hesitancy of a lot of people for, for sharing that. Um, cause, cause we are, I mean, paleontologists, believe it or not, paleontologists are people and humans and, and, and obviously respond to those kind of things. So it, it's, it's a really fascinating thing that you folk are needing to navigate, I guess. Yeah, so you, you can have, like, you know, there, there needs to be so, essentially, like, all, all it is, um, is you just want to be, you know, credited, like, accredited for your work. So with um, putting your specimens up on VAMP, and we use Morphosource as, as our host um, platform, 
um, is you can track the use of your specimens. You can you can track what they're being used for, um, you know, um, and and what papers. You know, there, there's a DOI system, so they can be cited. These are citable entities, um, and so suddenly, you know, your your people aren't just taking your data and then publishing on it, and then you know you're, you're getting nothing out of it. You are getting essentially a citation from this. Um, and that encourages people to it's share. It's fantastic, isn't it? It's a great way. It's it it it, it, it solves that acknowledgement thing. Well, and the the creator of the scan will always retain control over the scan and that information. So you you can choose whether your scan is readily down like open, download, download upon request, and so on. And so, you you know you you absolutely retain control. And what we're trying to do is encourage more people to upload their data and um, we can collate it within VAMP and just celebrate it there. But we're really hoping that more and more individuals will come on board by uploading their data in this way to contribute to the project. So it, it's been running for three, four months now? Ish? Yeah, around We'll that. just go with ish. Uh, and what have, what have you learnt, the three of you, in that time in terms of how people are using it or whether there are things you might need to tweak, um, the utility of it? Because, because it was, it was, it's a big thing to throw out into the world and say, OK, go and interact with it. Because people often in, interact with things in ways that we don't expect or find it hard when we didn't think it might be hard and stuff. So how, what, 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 have you, what, have, what have you learned, the three of you, or the team? So, like, um, the community response has been great. Like, the, um, from launch, um, we, you know, essentially my, my phone had a, a number of people going, you know, hey, you know, this has been updated, you know, change the taxonomy of this. Um, and, and, like, a lot of people, you know, and, and generally just, like, a lot of people... You know, praise from a lot of people using it, um, but also you know, having all these specimens available doesn't just benefit science. Like it, it uh, in terms of like scientists, like it, it, it actually benefits a, um, a bunch of other people. So you know, you get people downloading specimens for you know your, the things you would expect. You know, uh, I want to three D print this because it's cool. Uh, to I've got a student project and I would I would like to to to, to use this model. Um, but my favorite one so far is um, there was a whole bunch of specimens downloaded because it's being used for a museum's um, uh, visual uh, impairment program. So actually giving, like, to, to 3D print these specimens and allow people with, like, you know, with, with, um, with visual impairments who would have it difficult to see normal displays of fossils to actually, like... Are these 3D? Yeah, you, to, to touch them. They can and, touch and view, them, they can hold them, they can feel absolutely. all the little, little nodules and, 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 and structures and things on it. Yeah, and that's a really important point is this is a major educational tool as well. So it's not just for people who are doing research, it's about making things available regardless of the age of the user. And one of the sections of the site, and we have to acknowledge as well that this is absolutely in its infancy. So we've just got a seed grant to start to upload our first 100 organisms, basically. And from there, we plan to eventually have this as the central repository for all digital data relating to Australian fossils. So it's in the very early infancy, but we have a section of the site that is dedicated to teaching as well, where we're going to be introducing more kind of class set style of things that can be instantly adapted to a particular learning aim. So uh, how did you decide what was going to be the first bunch to go up? Or was it just all your favourite things? <laughs> it's all fish, isn't it, Alice? Oh, I wish, I wish. Imagine that. Um, all fish and footprints from Aaron. Yep. Yeah, well, you know, we're, we're, it's a fin Flinders University-led initiative, so the um, inclusions are really reflecting strongly the interests of the, the, um, the research group here at Flinders University. But again, we worked with... Um, other amazing paleontologists in South Australia. We got Diego and Tori um, contributing a lot of the really early life stuff, which was just so special. Um, but yeah, we just, you know, it was 
version 1.0 and we had a limited budget and um, yeah, we just sort of, we wanted to make sure we had a, a good taxonomic spread across the vertebrates at least and then we've got the very early, early life, um, but there's definitely room for improvement. And just relating back to your previous question, since the launch it's been so cool to get interest from other people who are like, oh hey, I've got a load of horseshoe crabs or hey I know someone who's at the botanic garden and has uh, fossil plants that could be included or and things like this and so it's really exciting to see how this will grow in the future which is a really fascinating part of the I guess the the citizen science element of it the democratization of science in a way of of it, it's not necessarily just going to be the the cultural institutions and the universities you know, there might be somebody that finds a fossil on their property that they're reluctant to give up the fossil because they found it in, in a little cave or something. But, hey, maybe they, they'll, they'll happily allow it to be scanned. And all of a sudden, science has access to that particular thing. Aaron? But to answer Mesozoic Mill's unanswered question, uh, <laughs> the first part of this... Um, project is partnering with the South Australian Museum, the Western Australian and the Northern Territory Museum uh, and as our listeners may well know, a lot of the dinosaur fossils uh, from Australia are from Queensland and from Victoria, uh, so they will absolutely become part of VAMP at a later point in time, but in terms of what we've got in, ter in Mesozoic animals represented in South Australia, there aren't a huge range of them. But we, we are definitely looking at including a whole range of the marine reptiles. It's just a lot of them are on display at the moment, so they're tricky to scan. Yeah, and, and I guess the, the core thing is, is that you're learning things along the way, as we've talked about in terms of, you know, you've learned things in the last few months, and there's that stuff that you're talking about, Jacob, of, 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 of the visually impaired mm. kids being able to have access to things in a particular way. So... Okay, so I'm sitting in front of my laptop. I've I've opened the website. What? How do I find my way through Vamp? What What am I looking for? What What am I going to see? Because because it's not it's it's not articulated skeletons, is it? It's it's individual. Uh, well, it, it might depend on the on the specimen. Or, so, yeah. Um, yeah, we've got the. You can explore. You can, I mean, there's a simple search box, so if you've got something that you're really interested in, you can always type that in and see if something pops up. But we've got menus that you can explore that are arranged taxonomically, so um, you can go through... I'm, I'm a vertebrate paleontologist. I always gravitate straight to the vertebrates. And then fish is there, but you can choose to go follow a series of drop-down menus into various fish... Um, and all throughout the other vertebrate groups as well. And so that's a really good way just to get a feel for what exactly is on there. Um, and the thing is that you can, yeah, I mean, you can do it on your phone, you can do it on any computer, um, navigate through these pages, and there should be some graphics, a bit of information about that group or that taxon available. And this is all we've really tried our best to get that written by experts, and in, including the most up to date taxonomy for these various groups. Um, but you don't necessarily, it's not necessarily going to be heavy and clunky downloading, auto-downloading a huge data set or anything. So you only go to that download phase if you are, you know, that super keen fan or you have that specific reason to do so. So you can, there's a sort of interactive, rotatable viewer. So you can have a look at the data, the model on that screen before you decide to sort of delve in deep and request yeah, the download. I may yeah. have done that with a few bits of Thylacoleo. <laughs> yeah, because you do, and you, you oh, twirl I saw. them around. And you, you saw, oh, <laughs> I, you, I, I, always, I always see. <laughs> <You> say, <laughs> that's, okay, uh, so what, one, one of the questions I like to ask when I'm working on a project is uh, to see in terms of thinking about where the project might go or what it might become is like, if money didn't matter, what could VAMP look like? I mean, what, what's, what's, what's the dream with this? And, and I guess we've got a sense of it in terms of accessibility and stuff. But where, where do you each think? And, and maybe start with you, Jacob. Look, like, if, if money didn't matter, um, like, it's with this data, um, it's not 
collecting it. That's not the problem um, because scientists are going out there. This this technology is is so accessible now. Almost like most labs uh, have like a have a structured light scan, and a lot of labs are digitizing things. It's you know um, platforms and infrastructure in place to curate and store this data and to make it accessible. That's where you know a lot of the the hard work is and. You know, Vamp is a Vamp is a start. Um, you know, but we're we're hosted by like Morphosource, which is primarily an American kind of like the servers are in a, in in the states. We don't have anything in Australia yet for this kind of stuff. Um, and so, if if money wasn't an option, we'd have our own our our own servers, server. have our own stuff. servers, have our yeah. own IT people working on this and curating it. Because at the moment, it's very much like a passion project and you know hopefully it grows from there but yeah it's yeah alice you've got an unlimited bucket of money <laughs> if money was no object then i think every specimen in every museum in the country should be digitized in some way um and this is you know it's about making the specimens available but it's also a safeguard because we've seen over time, well, throughout history, we've seen museums be destroyed, whether through, um, uh, you know. Brazil, just a few yeah, years Brazil, ago. Yeah, Brazil, fire, you loads know, of specimens destroyed. And a bunch yeah, of other really yeah. cool specimens. Or, you know, through wars and, and, and various other things, or just the way things naturally get broken over time in museums from time to time. So it's, um, you know, it's kind of a digital backup of these absolutely precious parts of our paleontological and geological heritage. Aaron? Yeah, it's, it's also about data security. So one of the things about, regardless of where it's being stored in the world, is that there are no, in a geological timescale, long-term projects happening. So having the funding indefinitely to ensure that that data is supported. So obviously a server in Australia would be good, but having a long-term plan and people employed. But if we're talking about unlimited funds, we could have a whole raft of people working with a whole range of different scanning technologies that could be going out there and scanning actively or offering services to anybody who wants that digital data produced and can then be uploaded as well. Just one last thing to add as well onto that unlimited money wise, um, you know, these scans are great, but they don't hold up to the physical specimen and unlimited money, you know, like it would be to have better funded museums in general and to have these specimens, you know, having a lot more money going into the, these areas because while yes, these scans are a safeguard and you can, you can access them all over the world, sometimes, you know, nothing really compares to the real thing. So it's also about, you know, that these are designed to complement the specimens, to, not to replace them. There was, a, there was a conversation on, on one of the local radio stations a couple of months ago and I was asked to, to, to put in my two cents worth because they were talking about bringing back the Investigator Science and Technology Centre. And they said, well, what do you think, Mark? It's, it's a great idea. I said, well, what would be a great idea is if we were to fund the current institutions and stuff. Um, we've only got a short time remaining. Um, you've each got about 15 seconds to tell people why they should tune in and use VAMP. Oh, I, 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 <laughs> oh boy, I'm on the spot. Uh, no, there's some real cool stuff on there. And, uh, you know, it took me a very long time to go around and collect them all. So Yes, yeah, so Jacob did a lot of work. So, but, but also, you're absolutely right, because yeah. I've had a look through it. Alice. Well, you know, in one place, from the comfort of your couch or your home, you can explore... The earliest Ediacaran life, trilobites, horseshoe crabs, amazing Devonian fish, all these megafauna, various, you know, there's reptiles, there's birds. I think um, there's, I think Phoebe, if you were here for the previous podcast, there's even some birds with pathologies there if you're interested to have a look at that. Aaron. It's the future of paleontology data story. <laughs> Me. Well, I think that's... Um, that's that's the best time to finish on. Please thank our panellists. <laughs> and-
Ryan, please thank Flinders University Paleontology Society, Adelaide University Paleontologists, National Science Week and Dinosaur University. It's time to spread some paleo jazz.